We were making a lot of pictures at that time in the 70s. We had our own distribution. That's going to be interesting yeah. to talk about because that's still a dilemma, you know. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, a lot of my friends, they, they, they had no choice but to work outside. Yeah. And now Black Panther changed it all, I think. So. Black Panther really has changed uh, the game. Yeah. Ah, how so? Well, uh, uh, simply the fact that a picture with a, essentially a totally black cast can do, I don't know what, 100, 200 million dollars, maybe more of business has made people wake up and say, wait a minute, there's an audience here, we've been missing it, we well, didn't understand. Okay, well, let me, your math, is, let's do the math. So, 200 million dollars in 2019, in 1972, might have been what 30 million or something. Yeah. So something, shaft. Yeah. It's nothing. It's the yeah. same thing. Yeah. Um, and you were making way tons of black take Well, you were taking advantage of that trend. Mm. So I, I want to ask you about that for sure. Okay. And um, and clearly before that, your your only flop that you that you admit. <laughs> Although I've seen Darktown Strutters. Oh yeah, that was done by my brother. Gene. You put it out. Why did you put that out? Um, he couldn't get distribution on it. I love that movie. Yeah. I, you know, I never saw it. I didn't want to tell him. We were so busy. I said, sure, you yeah, will distribute it. <laughs> we, and you put it out twice. I, I, well, I, say, I, I don't have a doctor. I have a poster. I collect posters. I don't, I, is, but Gene's still around, right? He, how's he doing? Who? Your brother, Gene. Gene is smarter than I am. He's a year younger than I am, and he retired. He uh, said, that's it. Uh, I've worked long enough. Fair enough. And what keeps you going? I know you're in here. I today. simply, I simply like to make films. Just that. Uh, I'd rather make films than uh, than sit on the beach. Now you hit a chord. I, I've been to Sundance a few times, and um, so many people, it's bit, they, the bug has bit them. And um, but they, they, when I talk to people, there's still that fear. How do I, how do I maintain longevity? Because it's a tough fight, and you know. Well, one of the ways is if you're independent and have been independent all the way, there's nobody to fire you. <laughs> okay, and you learn that pretty quick. Right. Have you ever been fired? Uh, I got into a dispute with Columbia once, uh, but we settled it, and okay. it was okay. I was supposed to be under contract, and uh, it was taken care of. Okay, I understand. Uh, Eddie if I was very privileged, because I think the first week Jack Nicholson was there, Oh yeah, and, and um, that was another breakthrough movie. Well, not Little Shop of Horrors, but Easy Rider. Yeah, um, which he he I guess it cooked all the soup on the road for everybody. He said uh, what kept him in the game was I mean I, this stuck with me because it was like the first week. He said what kept me in the game, you know, defined me was watching all the other people that were my peers succeed and get TV shows and have opportunities on everything. You know, Dennis Hopper and you know, Peter Fonda all had opportunities before him. So when Easy Rider broke, I think his next thing was um, the basketball, the, the, uh, the drive, what is it? Drive, he driver, said. driver. Yeah. No, 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 no. No, it was the, Drive, he said? Or? Drive, he said, thank yeah, you. Yeah, right. Bill Butler. Yeah. Photograph. So, you know, so you, so, oh yeah, so let's get into it. Um, hey everybody, this is Mike. Um, and uh, wow, I don't even know what to say. It's such an honor and privilege to be in a room, once again, I should say, with um, a true king of everything that I love, which is motion pictures and entertainment. Not so much Hollywood, um, but, uh, and if you don't recognize this man's face, say hi, everybody. Um, you definitely know his work. Uh, and uh, he's, he is a, not only a true master, and renegade, uh, but someone who has survived many, many battles. We've seen the rise and decline of drive-through movie theaters, the advent of American blockbusters, uh, VHS moving to DVD and now streaming, which is where most people, I, I would assume, are gonna be watching this, unless it's really good, <laughs> and then we'll sell it uh, on Blu-ray. Come to, come to, what is it, not to a theater near you. How do you say it? Was it a trailer talk? 
Taylor Talks. He said, yeah. coming to a theater near you. Well, we don't have to go to a theater anymore. Yeah. We can sit right here and spend some time with Mr. Roger Corman. How are you doing, sir? Very good. I'm so happy to see you, and you look well, and I know you, I don't believe you have a suntan, well, but you came from Mexico. Uh, uh, I just got back from, uh, actually it was a good hotel. They had umbrellas all over the beach. <laughs> oh, you're, are you prone to burning and? Just a little bit. You don't just like the water. Bit. You don't like, do you, it was, a, it was a tough time for you not to be in this room? Yeah, well, I can swim, but I can't swim as I form as I used to be able to. I used to dive into the big waves. Mm. Now I waited for it to be a little calmer. I understand. Well, you, everybody needs a little R&R, &R, and I'm, I'm, this is my R&R &R to be here in L.A. So um, thank you for, uh, I really appreciate this uh, time that you're going to spend with us. I don't know how much we have, but I, I, I don't want to rush anything because uh, we, you know, it's life. You know, I might not have the money to fly here. Yeah. When when I have a question, um, so let's make the let's make the most of it. Uh, in terms of so I, you know a lot of things have changed, but primarily audiences have not. You know there's there's a recipe I think in terms of at least for you, um, what makes a a good film a movie that people want to see, and I know that uh, you often talk about that. Well. Uh, William Goldman, one of the greatest screenwriters, wrote a book on screenwriting, and in Hollywood at least, everybody remembers the first sentence. The first sentence of his book was, nobody knows anything. I think he was partially correct. I think he was right that I would say, nobody knows everything. But we, in general, we've got a pretty good idea, and we can do what I call the informed guess based upon our experience and our own abilities and so forth, we can make an informed guess as to what will work. We're going to be wrong uh, sometimes, but at least we work with some experience. Right. But, I mean, I understand that completely, you know, you, and then, um, and there's, there's a process to everything. So, but I think as information spreads, um, and different cultures come into the game. We start to see things differently. Oh, oh I should also mention all these Oscar nominations behind you. You've, you've also in yeah. introduced a lot of Americans to some great European and Japanese and filmmakers from around the world. You know, so we appreciate you for that. Yeah. Um, but uh, in terms of, yeah, and also people I think are being becoming more aware of intuition. And um, you know, one of the people I follow is Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know if you oh, follow, yes. if you read his books. Yeah, you know, the whole concept. Actually, uh, I met him and talked with him in New York at one time. Mm -hmm. I remember I said, uh, he said something about uh, do something a thousand times or something. The ten thousand ten th hour rule. Yeah, the ten. I said I'm working on it, and he said I think you've done it. <laughs> he got to it quick. <laughs> well, ten thousand hours for most people is ten years, but. Um, I think you accelerated that rate. I mean, how many setups is your record again? I once did 60, but uh, that was uh, misleading because I was shooting a Western and I had horses coming by from here, horses coming by from there, and I was just knocking them off like that and they were uh, just quick setups. So you just mat you matted it out the night before or you have, you, you storyboard or you just figure it out? Yeah. I out? storyboard, I'd say, 80 to 90 percent of my shots. Uh, when the young directors working with me, I uh, talked to them about the importance of storyboarding and I said, you have to storyboard all your shots. Mm -hmm. I never tell them, I never storyboarded all my shots, but I storyboarded, storyboarded most of them and that's all I expect them to do. The only one who I think really did storyboard 100 percent was Marty Scorsese. Mm -hmm. I was startled when I saw what he had done. He laid out the whole... He laid out every for shot. For what but, film? But this was a picture called Boxcar Bertha mm. that he directed for me. It was about a woman outlaw in the South. Mm. He was a New York boy, and I was advised that uh, this guy doesn't know anything about the South. And I said, but it's, I think he's a good director. I don't care. A good director can direct anything. Now, I would say a good director probably has certain things he can direct better than others, but still, I believe a good director can direct anything. Because right, primarily, once you're on the set, it's problem solving. Yes, and, exactly. And, and attitude adjustment. You have to sort of be the metronome 
of the day. Yeah. And it seems like you operate at a different, you have a different attitude in terms of, um, well, actually, you know, I feel like the attitudes come back quicker, but in a different sense, because now people have 15 cameras going, you know. Yes. And I don't know if you ever had the expense to even have. I didn't have that many cameras because when I was director, we were shooting with film, and uh, uh, the film cameras were so much bigger and heavier than the digital cameras. Right. And also, I was very careful about my composition. I might have, for instance, when I was doing the Edgar Allan Poe pictures, uh, I was trying to make the sets look more elaborate than they were, and one of my tricks was I would have a red candelabra mm. in front of the camera and the actors back there and the candelabra would be burning okay. and would obscure the fact that the set wasn't quite that good. Now, that was a specific composition for one camera. So if I've got the one camera here and the candelabra there, if I've got another camera there, I'm not getting that composition. So I can understand the convenience of working with a number of cameras, but I think you, you're not able to get the precise composition on on every camera. Right. Not only that, you can save time in lighting if you're if you're changing if you're ch if you're calling attention to the depth of field or different things. Like a lot of I know I'm sure it's a struggle on any set, giving uh, how much time the actors need, how many takes you can give them, how how much time the, they need to set up anything, especially the lighting. A lot of DPs and you've worked with everyone. Um, they they don't like the two camera or three camera because they they can't be precise but yeah and it leads to flat lighting so i i, I kind of sense that by by doing other things with the lens and the composition you can uh kind of give an excuse for other people not being ex ex exactly on par is that is that correct or i think that's correct now i can see in some cases say where you're shooting a medium shot and a close shot, and you've got the cameras right together. Mm -hmm. uh, that 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 can work. But say uh, say you've got a leading lady who is getting a little bit old. Mm -hmm. You really want the camera in one position, and you want the cameraman. Now it's a cinematographer. Mm -hmm. You want the cameraman to light her exactly so that she looks best mm. and you can't get that if you've got cameras all over the place right. because the cameraman has to really hit that the eye the cheekbones uh, certain yeah. cameramen were known for their ability to photograph Just, leading ladies yeah oh i mean um well fi they produce visions of light which which is the whole you know it's like uh, it's a shame it's so hard to get but it's it it, it I was lucky it, it turned me on to just the, you know, because, you know, a lot of us, we just discovered the old films on VHS. We didn't get the, blue, like, detours coming out on Blu-ray. I don't even know if I want to see it yeah. because it looks so clean. Yeah. And I don't, I don't, my my experience of it was, you know, like watching on TV late at night or something, you know. So I, I, sw I really want Criterion just to give us, like, the bootleg scratchy print in addition to the the <laughs> clear one you know but it's it's it's, it's, an, it's great that shop factory is doing the, the honor for you to to restore and, and make all that stuff great so. yes but um in terms in terms of um you know the uh i know jonathan demi over here you have a signed thing from him i worked with him on beloved by the way um but uh in the documentary they made about you he talks he says that you sit down everybody with every director before there's a whole prep that goes in i don't know how long it takes a week or how much prep you give anybody to make your projects but but everybody gets the same spiel is that is that correct well it is pretty much it varies from time to time but the main thing i emphasize really is pre-production planning not only the storyboarding but everything else particularly if you're working with a short of um, a short schedule because of your budget you don't want to waste your time say you've got which i did 10 day schedules and when i moved to the big time i had 15 day schedules you don't want to waste your time figuring out problems on the set you want to have anticipated those problems figure them out in advance so you're able to work quickly. Now problems are always going to come up and you allow for that, 
But if you've planned in advance, for instance, by storyboarding, you've got all your shots or most of your shots set in advance, you know you're not going to shoot them all exactly that yeah. way. Uh, situations change when you're on the set. A shot you plan one way doesn't work. Or maybe you get an idea on the set that's better than your storyboard and you switch to that. But at least you've got the skeleton there. You've got the basis. So it's comparatively easy to vary from it. And just as the uh, same thing with actors, you don't want to spend a lot of time preparing and rehearsing with actors on the set. If you have talked to the actors, gone over the motivation, as it were, discussed the character with the actor so that you and the actor are agreed on the interpretation before you start shooting, mm -hmm. you're not going to get into what sometimes happens, some big discussion, if not argument, with an actor on the set while the crew is standing there mm -hmm. waiting for you to finish. Which You've done all the, the whole yeah, energy yeah, depending on how much yeah. power you have on You've the done set. all that in advance so that on the set it's a minimum that's, of that's direction. That. Let's, let's, let's get into that a little bit because you know power dynamics on the set are, are very tricky mm -hmm. and I've experienced it being at AFI being a, uh, one of the few black students trying to direct authority of people and being questioned or maybe not maybe I'm not articulating properly because I'm new to it. Mm. Um, and that does, that does create a lot of friction and tension that could last years. And I know when I talk, when, especially when I speak to women directors, there's a huge issue with that. I mean, like what, how, how, how do you circumvent that? If, like, if one of your directors was just frustrated for whatever reason, what, what kind of conversation does that become? Well, what I talk to him about is the very first shot the crew kind of sizes the director up on the first shot. If the director walk, comes onto the set and looks around and says, all right, now let me figure out where I'm going to put the camera, uh, the crew knows this guy is not prepared. Mm -hmm. But I remember when Ron Howard did his first picture for me, I talked to him about coming on the set and w acting in such a way that the crew knows what you're doing. And I remember we were shooting at a house in Brentwood and I was just sitting there and Ron came in and the cameraman and the crew were ready and he used the woman who played his mother on uh, Happy Days and he said, uh, she will come in the door there and she's going to move over there and she's going to sit in that chair. The camera will be with a 30 lens on a dolly here. We're going to start at this spot here. We're going to be dollying and panning with her over to there. She sits down. We cut and we'll go in for a close-up when she sits down. I'm going to get a cup of coffee. Let me know when you're ready. They knew right there that Ron knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. That is, they say he had done his homework. Exactly. And so he had established his position with the first shot. Right. Whereas and, uh, I remember one of the few directors, most of the directors that started with us did very well. But I remember I talked to this one guy about um, all these things and this is not normal. We normally do not start with night shooting because it's so difficult. But for whatever the, the conditions we did. And we were some sitting somewhere, uh, shooting somewhere in East Los Angeles on a vacant lot between two buildings. And he said, all right, the first shot is here. The, the, uh, the, the, uh, light, uh, the actor is here. The building is behind. Light that. So they lit it, and he said, fine. He said, cut, print. He says, now, the next shot is over here. Uh, light this and the building behind. And they said, OK, do this. And uh, uh, they shot it. And he said, all right, now, the next shot is back over here, uh, like the first shot. And the cameraman walked off the set. And I thought... Oh, because you, you can't flip your coverage. Yeah, it was... Uh, they had already lit this whole thing. Yeah. Torn it down, put up all the lighting over there, and then he says, go back and relight this. There was this guy who was not prepared and had not thought about what was going to happen. Right. And it's a lot easier, you know, I mean, go, going back to Detour, I mean, now, not to compare, uh, Detour's a classic. Yeah. But you've you've outnumbered them. You've <laughs> done more classics. So I'm not I'm not, I'm not making a, a value comparison, but in terms of uh, somebody, I guess predating your entry, your adventure into this thing, 
Ulmer was the guy. I think you broke his record. Let's <laughs> put it that way. In terms of like, if you, if uh, for people aren't for people that don't know, if if uh, Roger Corman is uh, the Jesse Owens of American independent film. Uh, Edgar D. Omer is the guy that nobody remembers <laughs> whatsoever, um, but still deserves his criterion. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and one of his tricks, and I, I tried it, I was reading, because, you know, that's the other thing, when before audio commentary, you had to read the books and stuff, and they said one of his tricks was to shoot all, all of his di dialogue scenes against the same wall, but then to save time, um, he would shoot the reverses of the dialogue against the exact same wall and just kind of flip it, flip the eye line so the camera's on the other side. And it was just a screen direction trick. Mm -hmm. But I tried it and I, I didn't realize, just from reading it and not seeing it, how to do it like a diagram, I had the eye lines both looking in the same direction. And I didn't know until we got the film back from the lab that I screwed that up. So that's a film that no one ever will ever see. Just well, you know, what you're saying is uh, typical on the 100, as so you say, the eye line, or as mm -hmm. we used to say, the 180 degree line. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, every director struggles with that. But after a while, you're doing it automatically. You mm -hmm. don't even think about it anymore because it's sort of ingrained in your mind and you just do it. Well, but the at the beginning, you really have to study. Now, let me see. She was looking this way. Now she's looking this way. Oh, I always trust the DP with that because I don't. I can't remember five setups before. Yeah. I don't like my. I'm in. I'm. I'm tuned into story. Like so, I can tell the actor. Um, or the scene before this is that. Keep this. Keep that same energy together, or at least remember where you were, the scene before, because I know actors prepare differently. Also. Yeah. But. But um, no, it's, I think it was, my problem was we don't think, like reading a, fl a flat piece of paper and just reading the idea and not seeing even a diagram from above, you're not thinking in three dimensions. I mean, it's not even, I can do eye lines, not, not because of practice. It was just when I got on the set with a camera or a viewfinder, I could actually say, all right, um, and I'm not storyboarding, I can say, all right, and you, and you also have to leave some freedom for the actors to do their thing, you can't dictate exactly where they need to stand or how how much room or the light is going to give them. You have to um, have enough freedom. So so regardless of what your shots are, and sometimes most of the time when I shoot, I'm just making a list. Like I need this shot, this shot, this shot, and I I trust that when I get there, because I shoot like documentary. I say, okay, well he's talking here, this is talking here. I'm not trying to do anything super fancy because mm -hmm. I'm more interesting character and story but I but I have had issues with you know nobody wants to shoot coverage nobody wants to do the same boring shot people don't pay attention and then after a while even even you can see the light just you know fade uh, out yeah. of the actor you're doing the same take and nothing's moving it becomes an issue so for a lot of people mm -hmm. um, and you know I'm not one to bounce around either so what are the other rules when, you, when you're talking to Ron Howard or Jonathan Demme or Joe Dante to get ready for a film? Well, now, it's interesting, something you just mentioned when you said diagrams from above. Mm -hmm. The normal storyboard is you're drawing the picture. Now, my uh, education, my degree is actually in engineering, so I was trained to work with plans. And instead of the normal storyboard, I drew diagrams from above like a plan so i would have the shot of the here and i'd have the camera here and actors there and diagrams from above knowing that i'd get the actual composition later on so that made it a little easier to work with the 180 degree line but it comes back again and again to me to the preparation the preparation with the story if the script isn't right don't shoot. The, it starts with the script. Your script must be as good as you can make it. Then you plan your shooting. You plan working with the actors in advance. You come on the set and you respect everybody. Uh, I've seen good directors suddenly become dictators on the set and this is not that kind of a medium. Everybody is working together. The grip is doing the best job he can, and you must recognize that. You don't want to be weak and uh, let other people push you around, but you don't want to be a dictator. You want to be 
what should I say, yeah. the first among equals. We're all working together. Well, like Rob Reiner, I don't know if he worked with you, but I mean, he, he, you know, it's just, you know, any idea on the set is a good idea, as long as I take it. I'll take yeah. all the credit for any idea that comes. Yeah. You know, I mean, do you, do you have a direct specific experiences that, that you've had where, you know, the key grip just noticed something? or? Well, it's interesting you mentioned the key grip. When I first started, I was working with Chuck Hanawalt, who was a veteran grip, and he would sometimes give me ideas, so I took ideas from grips. Your name's still on the contract. Yes, right. Yeah, so you don't have you ever thanked the key grip at the Oscars? <laughs> I would like to. Th what's his name? Yeah. Chuck Hannibal. I'll thank him now. Thank, thank you, Chuck Hannibal. Hannibal. Check Chuck Hannibal. Yeah, right. For giving the idea for a couple of shots, many a couple shots, of shots, the X-ray eyes, changing the tint. <laughs> on the color, maybe that should be more green or something. I don't know. Um, just painting a picture for you to lighten it up. But um, you know, but yeah, the spiel because uh, Demi he says well, you have to have movement and this and mm -hmm. there's certainly uh, the, the 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 basic premise is that as much as the technology has changed, audiences are still fundamentally looking for yeah. the exact same thing from from all yeah. movies, all stories. What are those things? What is you know, besides Goldman? Uh, you know, like uh, maybe people don't have, I don't have the patience to read Aristotle's Poetics. I don't get it. I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. So, the but everybody understands when they hear, like you said, they remember the first sentence, everybody says, well, there's only like 12 stories in the world, mm -hmm. right? So assuming that we have a good script, what's needed f to make a motion picture? Because motion pictures to me incorporate all the arts and they're, they're the only one that exists, a visual that, that combine them all, but also now I can, take us to other places um, in our imagination and worlds and paint new, I, but also tr and transform our, I, our belief, our identity, but also have the power to transform cultures and, and the way we perceive the world. So all that, go with it. What you just said, I agree with 100%. I can, matter of fact, I can remember at a dinner party in London a number of years ago when I was directing a picture there, there was a critic from the London Times who was a literary critic, and he was talking about the fact that he did not consider motion pictures to be an art. And I said, I consider motion pictures to be the only true art of modern times, because before this, you wrote novels, you wrote plays, you wrote music, you painted, these were all static arts. Motion pictures are the art of movement. They reflect today's world and they are the true art. It was a heated but reasonably friendly because discussion. Was it, was it was because he saw the culture reflected in the art not being as valid as some of the, the art form that he appreciates or it was a, another thing beyond that? I think he just felt all motion pictures were a low form of entertainment. Mm. But on the other hand, you can say certain uh, other art forms have high forms and low forms, but they're still there. Their art encompasses high art, pop art, and bad art. It's mm -hmm. still part of art. And and you know you you can't you can't take uh, Art Blakey everywhere, but you can put him on a, a, re a film reel, and people can have that experience somewhat over time. Yes. So. Um, but the rules, Jonathan Demme's like, you know, he says it, I don't want, I don't want to cut to Jonathan Demme because you don't own the rights, so I'll get sued. So give me the spiel, pretend I'm Jonathan Demme, I'm walking in, I don't know what his first movie was for you, but uh, go ahead. Well, what I've said is a lot of it, uh, but another thing you mentioned movement, uh, uh, motion pictures are the, are the art of the moving image, uh, and I like to keep actors moving as much as is logical and reasonable within the scene. I don't like scenes where one person is sitting in a chair, the other person sitting in the other chair, and the scene is a series of close-ups. Uh, if I had a scene like that, I would have maybe somebody get up from the chair 
and go over and adjust the blinds on the window while he's talking, uh, just to get a little bit of movement within the, within the scene. Yeah. Things like that. But the things we've discussed already are, are pretty much it. There's no, uh, the no, no secret. Okay. Um, well, I think there are plenty of secrets. <laughs> um, you know, the, and the main one is that you got every with every advent of technology, there's some more things that you can discover to do with them. So, um, you know, but in term in terms of um, and also genre and theme, I think are important to audiences. There are certain things that are like right now, everything's superhero horror. The, yeah. the win wins. Um, and in your drive-in days, there are certain things and, and you know, there are certain movies that you couldn't even make today because the times have changed, but they're still entertaining. Yeah, you know. Um, so, you know, can can you speak to like what what works within the medium of film, and then the different delivery systems that you've had to look at from drive-in to VHS? Or what what were people looking for throughout those eras? Well, we know certain genres will what will are popular. They don't always work. For instance, genres I've worked in is a lot of science fiction, uh, uh, some horror. Uh, some action films and so forth. These genres always work, but you can't repeat. And to me, what I try to do, I try to go with what my experience has told me will work and then say, what can I bring new to it? Picasso once said, a full career in art is if you can bring one new thing which is more significant than uh, what I'm saying here, but one new thing to what all the artists have gone before. You add one layer to it. So to me, it's be aware of what succeeded before in films and then see what can I do to vary that, to bring something new to it. And is that for more for you or f to, to keep the audience guessing what's gonna happen? I think uh, it's for me and for the audience. The audience, wants to see certain things. Yet at the same time, they don't want it to be repetitious. They want to see a new version. So uh, I work with what I think has worked before, and I try to vary it. For instance, I'm very much socially conscious on the left, on the liberal side. But I don't want to make the motion picture a lecture on politics or economics or social science. I want the picture must be an entertainment, but within the entertainment, you can make your statement. I think it actually adds to the entertainment because it makes the audience think a little bit more while they're being entertained. Mm -hmm. It's a more fulfilling experience for the audience. That's 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 very true. That's that, that's right on. I like I like exactly how you phrased that because I, I always I always I feel that's a challenge. Um, I think people forget about story being the most important thing, and especially when we're in the sequels era. I think Marvel does it really well. Uh, Pixar they have the luxury of just doing it fifty times before they even render it. Yeah. You know, to get things right, animation and documentary also you have the luxury of time to stay with a topic or subject and make sure that you have the elements of the story to, to, to build a story from. Um, sometimes you have release dates. You know, a lot of times a movie will come out and then uh, six weeks later when it's on Blu-ray, oh, extra edition, you know, uh, you know, 40 extra minutes of this, or, oh, we, you know, the, the director's cut never gets shorter, I notice. <laughs> um, but, one movie I, I, I would love to see bonus features on that I don't know if they exist would be The Intruder, which is my main reason for being here. Actually, uh, there are no particular bonus features because I shot the picture in three weeks and uh, you just, everything I shot except a few things that I obviously didn't like, which I took out in the cutting room, mm -hmm. is in the film. The only thing from that standpoint, if we did have bonus features or a way to uh, refer to it was it had to do with the racial integration of schools in the South. And I wanted to shoot in the South because I wanted the look to be right and I only had a few Hollywood actors there. I used local people for uh, all the supporting roles. And I didn't want to 
offend anybody, so I went into the sort of the north-south. I didn't go into Alabama. Well, lucky you. We, yeah. I just talked to Bob Young, and, and um, he made an effort to do something similar. Um, he, he wanted to sh nothing but a man. Ended up being shot in New Jersey, I think. Yeah, which, was, but my, my plan was to go into the upper south, and actually I ended up in what's called the boot heel of Missouri, a little stretch of Missouri. Uh, they call it the boot hill because it's just a little stretch that goes south along the Mississippi between Kentucky and Tennessee. So I felt I'm working within the laws of Missouri, but I'm in the south, and the people have the southern accents. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt I would be better there, but even then, uh, certain things that were in the original script uh, were not in the script I showed people. Uh, oh, I you, you had a dummy script? Yes. You know who else does that? Um, Scorsese and Spike Lee to get around the ratings. You know, uh, yeah. they, they always have a, a, either a different script or they have a longer cut. Mm. So they, they know they're going to cut around. So you actually did this with the people of, of Mississippi? Yeah. yeah. These were was. just certain scenes which were written one way and I would shoot them as if ad lib uh, a different way. But the script didn't reflect that. And this is like the first time most people know Captain Kirk, I mean, so uh, William Shatner. Yeah. Uh, how did you discover him? Uh, I interviewed, I didn't have uh, very much money. It was a strange situation. I'd been uh, quite successful. I had never made a film that lost money. And any project I brought to a number of the independent studios, they would just take because we all we always made money, and I developed the script. Everybody turned it down, and I thought, well, uh, I want to make this. So my brother produced it. I directed. We backed it with with our own well, money. Was this like Carpetbaggers? Seems like the big budget studio version of The Intruder. Uh, uh, some some of those are big budget versions. Or hurry sundown. But, yeah, you know. but uh, we we were able to get away with our shooting. We did get uh, death threats, as a matter of fact. And on the last scene, which was a parade of the uh, cars of the Ku Klux Klan driving through a black neighborhood, uh, it was, uh, that was modified slightly in the script. Mm -hmm. And we had had death threats, and we were staying in this motel, mm -hmm. and it was going to be a night shoot. Okay, so, so I think maybe people don't know what this, we're talking all like it's inside baseball here. So uh, the intruder, also known as Shane, hmm. I hate your guts. You've tried many yeah, mu uh, multiple times to make your money back yeah, off right. this um, little film, uh, a gem. I think as as they say, uh, with all films that don't succeed in the United States, it's a big hit in France. Yeah. But um, you know, to me, it's a classic. You know. Um, because there's so, and not not just because it's there are very few films that touch that subject matter, but because it's it's, it's extremely well made, and not only topical but but um, I think again it gives gives you a glimpse into a society like it's like a, it's not it's not sci-fi. I I must take issue with you because you must have been butt hurt by the lack of success. You were on a roll. The next movie that you made with black people in it. Gas. Uh, also, and did not do as well. <laughs> I I had moved from shooting in a studio uh, in the '60s. I wanted to go out into the streets, mm -hmm. and the first picture was the Wild Angels, which was the first of the Hell's Angels biker movies. Mm -hmm. and now that film was a phenomenal success. Mm -hmm. I then. It went to the Venice Film Festival and a number of festivals, won some awards, and made a lot of money. I followed it up with The Trip, which was about LSD, which was written by Jack Nicholson, as a matter of fact, and was another giant success. And it went to the Cannes Film Festival and got great reviews and so forth. And then I moved away and did some other films, and a little later I decided to come back to that. And by that time, I was beginning to be a little dis bit uh, disillusioned with, w with the rebelliousness of the 60s. I believe in what we were doing was right. 
the rebels of the, of the 60s over time, I think, have been proven correct. But towards the end, the movement started to move a little bit more towards violence, and I th began to get a little bit disillusioned. So in gas, I criticized the movement for the first time, and gas failed. Oh. So maybe, uh, Maybe you've got to be careful you're with your criticism. I still want to criticize. So it wasn't the theater owners this time. It wasn't those racist rednecks. It was those hippies. It's, it's always the theater owners. And the theater owners uh, reflect the audience. Mm -hmm. They just see how much, will, how much money did this picture make? Uh, how many people came to see it? Well, look, I respect gas. I, lo I, I love seeing Ben Vereen Young. And it's just a crazy movie. I mean, maybe maybe some of the acid flashback is what gas really is. Um, but it was a George Armitage. Or so yes, he's a he great wrote, writer. I yeah. mean, he went on to do some really great yes. things. I think he was it something wild or something he did with Demi. I don't remember. My personal theory about gas: um, somebody was uncertain because I think it was too many S's. I don't oh, yeah. like when I Google it. It's like I never can. It's like s s s s. We're, and then, you know, but Sweet Sweetback, I think they had the exact right number of S's for 1970. Gas, I think, might have had either too many S's or too many dot, dot, dots for it to be as successful. And maybe not enough black people. That could be. So, um, yeah, but 70 was a big cha time of change, and you were also changing your business model as well. Um, and black exploitation kicks in. You weren't necessarily at the forefront of black exploitation, but you probably, again, were the most prolific in the trend. Um, can you speak to that? Okay, what happened in 1970, uh, I decided to form my own production and distribution company for a variety of reasons. And I was started, I thought I'm gonna be very safe at the beginning. I'm gonna work with genres I'm pretty certain will succeed because I only had a certain amount of money. So this is first, New World this Pictures. Is new World Pictures. There's so many new, New World, New Horizons, New. It's always something new with you. Yeah. What What is this? I have. But you have the same haircut all the time. <laughs> like, have you have you never not cut your hair? I mean, it's not a piece. I can see closely. Yeah. yeah. But it's all, you it, never had I, no beard ever photo with you no. with a beard or I, during the sixties I had a mustache for a little while a long mustache but anyway the color of the hair has changed this was black at one mm -hmm. time as you can see mm -hmm. it's no longer when black. you took that acid what color was what I've never taken acid I want to go back before we get into the the, the because you have all these science fiction and fantasy um, are great escape is entertainment. Yeah. And then um, the music was changing, the culture was changing clearly. I mean, you didn't benefit from the success of e Easy Rider, but that was a studio production that was led by the success of all the biker films that you were part of. Well, I, I was supposed to be executive producer of uh, e Easy Rider. I had started when I had uh, uh, Peter Fonda uh, playing the lead mm -hmm. in, Hell, in uh, the Hell's Angels picture. And then Dan, uh, Peter Fonda and Dennis Hopper mm -hmm. uh, playing the leads in uh, uh, in the trip mm -hmm. written by Jack Nicholson. Mm -hmm. And after the trip, Dennis and Peter came up with the idea for Easy Rider. And I'd made the first two pictures mm -hmm. for AIP, American Inter International, and they had financed it. And they said, uh, Peter, they were going to write it Peter was going to, and they were going to star in it, and Peter was to, to uh, produce, and Dennis was to direct. Right. And the deal, and, I, and they asked me to come in as executive producer and just sort of supervise, because they had not they done this. They brought you in, they this trusted, was, this was the Peter, actors, Peter, Peter the people you Dennis. worked with trusted you yeah. Yeah. to shepherd them, yeah. but somehow you got worked out. Yeah, so what happened, Everything was fine. Uh, there were such big successes on uh, mm -hmm. the Wild Angels and, uh, and the trip, except in one of the final meetings, an executive at AIP said, coming completely out of the blue, we want the right to replace Dennis as director if he falls more than one day behind schedule. And I could see the look on Peter and Dennis's face. Mm -hmm. And when they left, I said to him, that was not a smart thing to say. Dennis had actually a bad reputation for being, for being a troublemaker. But 
he had worked with me and we'd gotten along perfect, perfectly. I think because we were all young guys, we were working together and we were trying. Yeah. So our relationship um, uh, with him, despite his, re his uh, reputation, was as good as it could be. And I said, look, I've just finished this picture with Dennis. There was no problem. I know you're talking about his reputation, mm -hmm. but they don't like this. And there was no reason for you to have said that. Somebody at Columbia heard about this, yeah. and they offered them more money, and the, the picture moved over to Columbia. Interesting. I'm just I'm I'm just thinking, you know, from from my general knowledge. I mean, I, I don't have, I'm not an encyclopedia on this stuff. Um, it seems like a lot of a lot of the people that came through you in terms of training stayed on the outside. You know, like I'm thinking about Peter Fonda and Dennis Hopper and. Even Ron Howard, to an extent, he's not, he's, he didn't become a mainstream acting presence. He, he became a powerful force behind the scenes, and he and Brian Grazer, have, they've almost like made their version of you, um, you know, in, within, within a, main, a more mainstream structure. Um, what, what is it that, what's instilled, you know, from, from that? What, what do you take from that? I'm just looking at, I'm just looking at that. It's difficult to move from low budget and medium budget independent films to high budget major studio films. And for me, I've done a couple of pictures for the majors and actually had a, a nice experience. Mm -hmm. But um, you don't have your total independence unless you are one of the half a dozen great established directors. And I felt I preferred just to stay independent where I made all the decisions myself. Uh, people like, well, Francis Coppola, Marty Scorsese, Ron Howard, Jonathan Demme, and so forth, I've been able to maintain their independence within the studio system, which is a very difficult thing to do, and I really congratulate them uh, for what they've done. Concurrent with that influx of new talent, at that time um, was a, a sort of a new American cinema where you, you could have weird looking actors mm. and have them be bona fide movie stars like mm. a Dustin Hoffman or, or um, you use a guy Popeye Doyle, um, you know, I'm talking about Gene Hackman, all those people that were once considered unhirable suddenly became yeah. the major people, Roy Scheiders of the world, you know. But it seemed like there's still two, even though there was some talent filtering in and making money for Hollywood, this, it wasn't completely across the board. Or, That's or am I wrong? I don't no, know. I think you're right. Uh, some of the people who were playing leads in the low budget pictures just stayed there. A number, uh, as we know, um, Jack Nicholson, who was oh. a mainstay with us, became uh, a, ma a major actor. Uh, others like David Carradine, became a major actor for a while, but it didn't quite hold, but then settled in the sort of medium budget starring films. So how do you recognize talent? Uh, it's, it's very hard. It's a little easier having I've been essentially a writer, director, and producer most of my life. Mm -hmm. So having done that, I mean, I think I equipped to recognize it a little a bit easier. I find that in those areas, uh, anybody who has had a long, continuing, good career, they've all been intelligent, mm -hmm. and they've all been hard workers. Mm -hmm. And the third is the question mark, the creativity. Mm -hmm. And this is a matter of talking with them, and many of them, for instance, Francis Coppola was my assistant for a while, and it was clear he had the creativity. Mm -hmm. Jim Cameron was running all our science fiction for low budget mm -hmm. films, and it was clear he had the creativity. Right. And of course, he went on to fabulous success, yeah. and actually, he was able to maintain, it's a too long a story to get into here, he was able to maintain his independence while working for a major studio and spending more money than anybody had ever spent in history, uh, first on Titanic, which the studio had already decided in post-production they were so much over budget mm -hmm. that uh, they were gonna lose money. He was the only guy who said, no, we're gonna 
just we're still going to do it. it. You find a way, yeah, and then you, and you bring the people along with you that are not afraid to jump in. Yeah, and, and sometimes there's some bad movies come out of that, but <laughs> occasionally we get an Avatar or something. You know, people you have to be the true believer, captain. You know, we're going to you know conquistador. I don't know what your your parallel. What's your demeanor on the set? I try to recognize that everybody is working together, that we are all on the same team, and a way to put it would be this way. I'm the captain of the team. I'm not the dictator, but a team has a captain, and I'm the captain of the team. But everybody on the team contributes, and mu they must be recognized for their contribution. Fantastic. Um, so just in terms of subconscious, because so, I'm a big Gladwell fan, and I know you put the 10, probably 20, 30,000 hours. Uh, how does it change? Does it get better? Once you get to a certain level of mastery, does the, uh, and things are second nature to you, you know, like a football coach would be mm -hmm. able to call plays where a spectator would not even be able to see as many, as, as a wide a field. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, are, what are some of the turning points in your career? And then also in terms of world culture, and the way, um, I don't want to get into more culture. Um, let's break down in the first. So what, what are some of the turning points in your career where you, you felt like, uh, beyond the failures, mm. but where you made that quantum leap into another l level of either independence or mastery of your craft? Well, one of them was the critical success and the commercial failure of The Intruder. Uh, I decided the picture got all the reviews uh, because it was, it was a good film. Uh, it failed for two reasons. I think one, the audience didn't particularly want to see that subject. But second, I felt I was too serious on that film. I was guilty of forgetting that films are first and foremost entertainment. I was lecturing, I felt, to a certain extent on the film and that caused me to rethink how I was going to make films. And from then on in, I've said, first and foremost, the film must be an, an entertainment. I can make my statement, as I think I said earlier, I can make my statement, but it must be beneath the surface. That satisfies me and I think makes the film a better film. Mm -hmm. And that's the basic philosophy I've worked on since then. Now I will admit, some of the films had nothing beneath the surface. Right. What you see is what you get. The young nurses. Well, well, but the young nurses was, was an example. Um, the young nurses was the first film uh, yeah, we I made, that I produced and we distributed for New World. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I, our sales manager was from the South mm -hmm. and I think I had four nurses there and I said, I want one of them to be black. And he said, I can't sell the film in the South if one of those f nurses is black. Mm -hmm. I said, she's going to be black anyway. Mm -hmm. The picture had the black nurse in it, and it was a big success everywhere, including the South. When we started the next picture, the Southern sales manager said, be sure to put a black girl in there. Oh, did you hear that, Pam Greer? <laughs> so I really appreciate your time. This is this is so much fun for me. Okay. Um, Excuse me, gentlemen. Yeah. We are leaving. Oh, we're okay. winding it out. I don't want to leave you. Uh, Thank you so much. So, how are you feeling right now, sir? Feeling great, Mike. How's everything with you? It's 2019. You already <laughs> think about what? Death race? What? Death race. Tw uh, well, Death Race 2000 was the original. The one I'm working on now is Death Game 2084. And, and you're still the master of the game. You ha you're the king, what is it? You're a king in your own game and never a pawn to many. At least in my own mind. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Mike.